Hello, and welcome to Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about the people behind today's virology headlines. People just like you working to understand viruses and how they affect you. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we are talking with postdoctoral researchers involved in coronavirus and COVID-19 related research so that you can learn who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackray, and I am hosting this podcast from America's Heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. The role of previous infection with other types of cold coronaviruses in SARS-CoV-2 infection has been unclear from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. On November 19th, 2020, we talked with Dr. Singred Guma, a postdoc in the Hensley Lab at University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, who has been characterizing the antibody protection to SARS-CoV-2 to address this question and others. Singrid received her master's degree in infection and immunity from Utrecht University and her PhD from the Erasmus University Rotterdam in the Netherlands, studying the virological and immunological factors contributing to mumps outbreaks among vaccinated adolescents. In the Hensley lab, her focus is on characterizing antibody responses to seasonal influenza and SARS-CoV-2. So hi, Singrid, I'm happy to have you with us today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you become interested in virology research? I spent most of my life in the Netherlands. I grew up in a small village named Duivendrecht, and my parents still live there. We don't really have suburbs in the Netherlands, but here in the US, Duivendrecht would be considered a suburb of Amsterdam. Um, I went to high school in Amsterdam. It was only five miles biking, so I bike every day to school. And then when I finished high school, I decided to go to University College Maastricht, for my undergrad. This was one of the three liberal arts schools in the Netherlands at that time. And there I took some microbiology and immunology classes. And I decided to then do a master's at Utrecht University in infection and immunity. This was a two year program and you had to do two internships. And these internships were my first real bench work experience. Um, and then after I received my master's degree in 2012, I started my PhD at the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment, also in the Netherlands. And during my PhD research, I studied virological and immunological factors contributing to the mumps outbreaks among vaccinated adolescents. I obtained my PhD degree from Erasmus University Rotterdam in 2016, and I then joined Scott Hensley's lab at the University of Pennsylvania as a postdoctoral researcher. So I moved to Philadelphia with my husband in 2017. And um, we were very lucky that after our first year in Philadelphia, we got the opportunity to become caretakers of one of the boathouses here on Boathouse Row. So since 2018, we actually live in the Lighthouse, which is owned by the Sedgley Club, a women's club. Um, we live in a small apartment on the second floor. And um, the first floor is sometimes rented out for events, but when there are no events, we can use the beautiful indoor porch there and I have views on the Schuylkill River and the skyline of Philadelphia. So um, we're having a good time here in Philadelphia. In your background, so even before you got to your undergrad degree, did you have exposure to science or medicine in your family or, you know, through sort of like middle school and high school? We did have some projects at high school where um, we got into contact with science. There was a collaboration with the um, University of Amsterdam, and um, we visited our lab, uh, one of their labs a couple of times. Um, my family is not into science. My uh, father is a tax uh, consultant, and my mom used to be a French teacher. She, she retired two years ago from that, and they're now both working in um, my father's office. Um, so no, but I did have some experience at high school, and I really loved biology. So that was one of the reasons why I decided that I wanted to go um, more into that direction. And for me, University College Maastricht was a really great opportunity to um, figure out what the exact direction was that I wanted to continue with. And could you tell us in a little bit more detail, like how did you pick your graduate or your postdoctoral labs? Like why those, those particular labs? After my undergrad, I decided to do a master's in infection and immunity at Utrecht University. And then based on the internships I did during my master's, I figured out that I especially liked the combination of virology and immunology. So when I then looked for a PhD project, in the Netherlands, PhD research projects are most of the times offered as job openings. So you apply for a specific project 
And that project is what you will be working on during your time as a PhD student. Um, and then when there was a PhD project available about the mumps outbreaks among vaccinated adolescents, I decided that this was something that would perfectly fit my interests in both virology and immunology, because the circulating mumps viruses are different from the mumps vaccine strain. So that's the virological aspect. But there's also waning immunity that plays a role. Um, and next to that, several mumps outbreaks were related to specific events or settings. So epidemiological factors are also involved. Um, and I figured out that I really like this interplay um, between those different fields. And there was also something that I then looked for into a um, research project as a postdoc. And how did you hear about the Hensley lab or how did you sort of approach that? That was a little bit based on luck. Um, I was looking on the internet for um, postdoc positions that I would be interested in. Um, me and my husband decided that we wanted to spend a couple of years abroad and um, that it was a good time to do that as a postdoc. Um, so then I came across the Hensley lab and um, I really liked um, the research on influenza going on in the lab at that time because it also is this combination of immunology and virology. So that was really appealing for me. Um, and I just sent an email to Scott Hensley and um, yeah, he replied and here I am. <laughs> Follow up on that. Can you tell us a little bit about the influenza uh, work that you were doing before the COVID pandemic? So I started in the Hensley lab as a postdoc in 2017. So I'm here now for a little over three years. And um, one of the things I did is that I identified amino acid differences between the vaccine strains and circulating H3 and 2 uh, flu viruses that resulted in um, reduced reactivity to circulating strains. But I also studied age-specific differences in antibodies to contemporary H3 and 2 viruses. Um, and last year in 2019, fall of 2019, I had the opportunity to lead a human research study um, in which we collected blood from individuals before and after seasonal influenza vaccination to study antibody responses. But unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, we were not able to conduct this study this year. Um, I hope that I will be able to be involved in similar studies in the future. And why don't you tell us a little bit about then what you've been working on the last eight or nine months as far as um, the COVID pandemic? Yeah, so when the pandemic started, we uh, first set up serological assays to measure SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in blood. And um, from April until the beginning of July, we received about 7,000 serum samples from healthcare workers. So we tested all those serum samples in ELISA to measure IgG and IgM antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. And the aim was to report antibody results within about 48 hours after sample collection. And then nasopharyngeal swabs were collected from healthcare workers who tested seropositive in our assay. Um, and in this way, we were able to identify healthcare workers with an asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection and we could help prevent spread of the virus within the University of Pennsylvania health system. Um, the serological screening of healthcare workers for this study stopped in July, but we are still collecting follow-up samples from healthcare workers who tested positive in our uh, assay. And this will enable us to um, study immune responses over time. But besides healthcare workers, we also tested samples from other cohorts, including uh, convalescent plasma donors and recovered COVID patients. And one of the cohorts that I personally think is really interesting is a cohort of pregnant women who um, come to the hospital to deliver. And we've been testing leftover serum samples from those women since the beginning of the pandemic. And this enables us to look at seroprevalence rates in the community in Philadelphia over time. Um, we're still collecting samples, but we published a paper in Science Immunology last September showing that out of almost 1300 women who presented for delivery between um, beginning of April and beginning of June, more than 6% of those women had been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. And our most important finding in this study was that there were racial differences in exposure rates. So seropositivity rates were much higher in black women and in Hispanic women than in Asian women and in white non-Hispanic women. Um, we do not only receive leftover serum samples from the women presenting for delivery, but we also receive cord blood from their newborns. And this enabled us to study placental transfer of antibodies. Um, and we found that SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are efficiently transferred across the placenta. We don't know if those antibodies are really protective, 
um, for the newborn. But if they are protective, this could, for example, help inform design of vaccine trials during pregnancy. Do you have any follow-up samples to see if the babies themselves become positive or is that something that's outside of the study? No, that's something that's unfortunately outside of the study. Um, all the samples we receive are de-identified. Um, so the information we have is very limited and we don't follow up on those women and infants. And then is there work in your lab that's also looking at um, sort of the effect of pre-exposure to other, say, coronaviruses or other viruses as, as a way to protect against um, SARS-CoV-2, whether this is happening or not? Yes, we have actually uh, recently um, published a preprint um, on this. So we've been looking in samples that were collected before the pandemic um, to see if um, pre-existing antibodies to um, elicited by seasonal coronaviruses, if they might be cross-reactive with SARS-CoV-2 and if that might lead to uh, protection or not. Um, and we didn't find any association with protection to SARS-CoV-2. And can you comment on some of the earlier studies that seem to suggest that there might be some protection? Is there something that was different about your study or is it, was it just the number of uh, people examined? Um, why was it that this was thought to be possible in the beginning? What is difficult with all those different studies is that um, we know from some of those studies that the um, antibodies to seasonal coronaviruses, they wane pretty rapidly over time. The time point at which the samples were collected can be important for this. I mean, most of the studies, they don't have samples that were collected just before the pandemic. That would be ideal, but um, that is, of course, not the case. Um, the samples we've been testing were also collected in 2019. We had some samples collected in 2017 and also in some other years prior to the pandemic. So I think timing might play a role, um, maybe even seasonality, whether samples were collected in wintertime or summertime. And then another factor that I think we should be um, taking into consideration is um, where the study was conducted, in which country, because as far as I know, not a lot is known about circulation of seasonal coronaviruses with respect to uh, geographical areas in the world. So thinking more, gen uh, I guess, more broadly, um, what's been the most exciting science moment in your career so far? I think that is related to a study that we recently published actually in Nature Communications. Um, so it's about my flu research. Um, we had a study. Um, for the study, we tested more than 300 serum samples from both children and adults. And all those samples were collected in the summer of 2017. So just before the 2017-2018 flu season, which was a very severe flu season um, dominated by H3N2 seasonal influenza viruses. And in those samples, we measured antibody reactivity to two contemporary H3N2 viruses, but we also measured whether the antibodies we detected were able to neutralize the virus. And um, we found that the highest levels of neutralizing antibodies against contemporary H3N2 viruses um, were in children whereas most middle-aged adults have non-neutralizing antibodies. Um, for this study, we collaborated with Sarah Kobe's lab from the University of Chicago, and they helped us model how H3N2 influenza viruses evolved during the, um, during the time since they started circulating in humans in 1968. Um, middle-aged adults born in the 1960s and 70s were likely imprinted with H3N2 viruses that are very different from the contemporary H3N2 viruses. And when those middle-aged adults then get exposed to contemporary H3N2 viruses, they produce antibodies against regions that are conserved with the older H3N2 viruses. And those antibodies are for a large part non-neutralizing. And this is the idea of original antigenic sin, and this is not a new idea, but uh, so far this was only described for imprinting with different influenza subtypes, so H1N1 versus H3N2. Um, we know that individuals born before 1968, for example, who were imprinted with H1N1 viruses, those individuals were better protected during the 2009 influenza pandemic, um, which was caused by an H1N1 virus. Whereas younger individuals who were imprinted with H3N2 viruses, they were not so well protected during the um, 2009 influenza pandemic. Um, but here we found that also within a subtype, it matters what specific virus strain you are imprinted with. Um, and these findings are important to help us understand why the effectiveness of flu vaccines varies between age groups, 
Um, and this knowledge is important to design better vaccines that are able to elicit protective responses in all age groups. And I guess in the converse, what has been the most difficult thing you've had to overcome as a scientist and how did you overcome it? On a personal level, I would say our move from the Netherlands to the US was challenging sometimes, um, especially in the first couple of weeks after arrival. The move itself was pretty easy um, because we only took four suitcases with us since we lived in a furnished apartment for the first year. Um, but there are so many small things you have to take care of while you're starting your new job. Um, you have to open a new bank account while not having a US phone number yet. Um, you have to get a social security number. Um, but I was lucky that my husband at that time um, was able to deal with most of those issues while I was at work. Um, on a professional level, I find it sometimes difficult that we don't really get trained in management skills. Um, but people expect from you as a scientist at some point in your career that you just have those skills and that you're able to manage people. And um, then on top of that, there are some cultural differences. So Dutch people, I would say, tend to be more direct than people in the US. Um, so while developing my management skills, I try to take that into account. Although I think that most colleagues can actually appreciate my Dutch straightforward way of communicating. <laughs> And I guess to follow up on that, if you had a chance to ask your older self, say you at 60 or 70, nearing retirement, one question, what would it be? What would you want to know from your older self? Not sure if there would be one particular question to ask. I actually like to not exactly know how the future looks like. Um, I do think a lot about next steps in my career and whether I want to stay in academia or not. So maybe my question would be what career path I should choose. But on the other hand, yeah, maybe it's good to not know how your future looks like. And uh, on a more personal note, um, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you as an individual? So what you've been doing in the past eight or nine months or you know, the effects it's had on you? The first couple of months were very busy in lab. Um, I was in lab about three days a week to run Eliza's. And then when I was not in lab, I was coordinating all samples that needed to get tested and um, was analyzing data. But when we stopped testing those healthcare worker samples beginning of July, the pressure became much less. And nowadays I would say it almost feels as if we're back to normal, except for that most of my lab work is now related to COVID-19 instead of flu. Um, for me personally, one of the most difficult aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we're not able to travel to the Netherlands and that our families are not able to visit us here. Um, we stayed in the US last Christmas and we were actually planning to go home this year, but um, of course we had to cancel the plans. So we tried to stay in touch with everyone via Skype and other um, social media and to be patient until safe traveling is possible again. So I guess in um, some of the free time, have you picked up some new hobbies? Yeah, during the first couple of months, the free time was limited. But um, on sunny days, I tried to find some time to read books in the hammock in our garden. Um, I actually discovered that the hammock is a great place to analyze data and to read scientific papers. Um, we have a lot of squirrels and birds in our garden, and I spent so much time in our garden, also including um, while I was working. So uh, at some point, I had a feeling that I really started to even recognize the squirrels and birds that came visit us every day. Um, and during the weekends, we like to make day trips. Um, for us, being in the US is one big adventure. We try to discover as many places as possible. Um, although traveling is nowadays limited, we still try to go to places we haven't seen before um, that are not too far away from Philadelphia. So the last couple of months, we've made some beautiful hikes in state parks. Um, and when we're outside the city, we also like to buy our um, fruits, vegetables, and eggs directly from farmers. Um, a lot of them actually have roadside stands where you can just take the produce and leave money in a box. So to me, that feels as a very safe way to do your weekly groceries. And it's also a lot of fun. Um, and we spent, we spend a lot of time gardening. Um, like I think most people in the US who have a garden. <laughs> this was the second year that we grew some vegetables in our garden. Um, we had tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, eggplants, green beans and um, okra, and um, it feels very satisfying if you can cook a meal that consists of almost 
entirely of homegrown vegetables. Um, we also like to spend time in the kitchen and try new recipes. So um, we recently started making a list of recipes that we've never tried to make before, like um, French style lobster bisque, um, beef wellington. Um, I want to try to make some French pastries myself. So yeah, we still have some plans for the upcoming months. Um, and I guess um, as a virologist, how do you make decisions about how to keep yourself, your family and your community safe um, during the COVID pandemic? Well, first of all, I try to keep myself and my husband safe by following the COVID-19 guidelines. Um, we wear masks when we are outdoors. We wash our hands frequently. Um, we avoid large, large crowds as much as possible. Um, we also try to explain to friends and family why it is important that they follow the, the COVID-19 guidelines. Um, especially because we cannot easily travel to the Netherlands. It is important for us that everyone back home stays safe as well. Um, during the summer months, we have done some outdoor dining a couple of times. But currently, I don't think with the tents that are used for outdoor dining by a lot of restaurants, um, I don't feel safe with that. I don't think it's a really good idea, um, especially the tents that have closed walls to keep you warm. So currently we limit ourselves to takeout only. Um, and with grocery shopping, we try to limit that to once a week. Um, we try to go grocery shopping during quiet hours. Um, we still go grocery shopping with the two of us. It's almost a teamwork activity nowadays. Um, I have my shopping list on my phone and then my husband is in charge of uh, pushing the shopping cart and um, picking all the items on the list. Um, so yeah, we tried to do our best to stay safe. And um, what's what's the pandemic like where your family is in the Netherlands? How are they coping there? Um, right now, it looks like the, the peak, the second peak is getting uh, better. Uh, the number of cases is going down there. Um, for me, what was interesting to, um, it was really interesting for me to compare the situation in the US with the situation in the Netherlands especially also the measures that um, are in place. The Netherlands is um, actually very late in um, asking people to wear masks. Um, they started doing that a couple of weeks ago. Um, whereas here in the US, we're wearing masks since spring. Um, so that was really interesting to talk with family and friends back home about how we're coping here with the pandemic and then hearing their stories about going to a supermarket without a mask. All right, well, um, any last messages for our listeners? Any thoughts about the future of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, well, I think it's very exciting that um, Pfizer and Moderna um, have promising results for their COVID-19 vaccines. Um, but we shouldn't forget that it will take a while before those vaccines will be widely available. So um, until then, um, I hope everyone will be patient and follow the COVID-19 guidelines to limit spread of the virus as much as possible. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Singrid used antibody assays this summer to identify asymptomatically infected healthcare workers and others in the community to help prevent transmission of the virus, as well as to understand the increased impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection in women of color in the Philadelphia area. This has been Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackray, and thanks for listening. You can find us on Google, Apple, Amazon Music, Spotify, and other podcasts, or at lmtv.podbean.com. If you are a virologist interested in sharing who you are and what you do, please contact us at letusmeetthevirologists at gmail.com. 